A few weeks ago, I read a book called Making Feminist Sense of International Politics by a writer named Cynthia Enloe. In the book, Enloe puts forth a very strong argument and explores feminism in a way that may not immediately come to mind when the word is mentioned. She discusses how women change the world, and she's not referring to strong women in positions of power. She's not speaking of politicians or those with platforms we can easily read about in history books and news articles. Enlo is talking about the normal, everyday citizens all around us. Their influence often goes unnoticed, despite the fact that said influence is enormous. The first chapter sets the stage for the book and explores the concept I just described my mind inevitably drifted to Berserk, and it could not have been more fitting. For the purpose of this analysis, I am not concerned with women in positions of power and influence in the traditional sense, such as Princess Charlotte. I also want to extend this sentiment logically to the fantasy world in which Berserk is set. This means I don't want to discuss the impacts of strong magic users, such as Flora and Dinan, for obvious reasons. I don't even want to mention Shirake, because while her power is substantially less notable, she is truly a force to be reckoned with, and her magic is inseparable from her impact on the story. Then we have Casca and Farnese, two characters who are commonly praised among Berserk's best. Casca had a brutal upbringing, and she definitely was born and raised in obscurity. However, she later became the second in command of the Band of the Hawk, which eventually became the most renowned combat group in Midland. She even became THE highest ranking member, although temporarily, during Griffith's torture and rescue. Farnese comes from a prestigious family of nobility, and was the leader of an elite group of knights for the dominant religion, even if it was pretty much just an ornamental group. But I may be getting petty here, considering where the two characters later end up. However, plenty has been said about these two all over the internet, so it wouldn't be as fun for me to focus on them. I thought I could do something else and focus on minor characters instead, which is appropriate considering this whole concept of underappreciated women. This video is not about feminism in general, rather it is about a very specific way of looking through it. This means the aforementioned characters are not who I am concerned with today. I want to take a look at the little people, the people who would be considered nobodies by society. Those with no overt power and influence but have all actually been key to Berserk having any chance of a positive ending at all. All of these characters I'm about to mention have done plenty throughout the series with a solid list of achievements, but I'm specifically going to explore their actions that have had clear benefits on a grander scale. And the three characters I want to talk about are the following. Jill. A shy village girl with little attachment to any resident of her birthplace, including her own parents. She has no status. Erica, an orphan girl who lived in a remote area with her adopted father, later a wandering traveler with Rickert. She has no status. Luca, a former prostitute who refused to hold on to her wealth. The last thing she wanted was fame. Later she is an innkeeper for refugees at Falconia, and she has little status. Jill's contribution to the world of Berserk is most evident through the massive impact she had on Guts, the hero of the story. Without her presence in the Lost Children section, Guts almost certainly would not have gotten his act together soon enough, and we would be looking at an entirely different manga. This all starts after Guts saves Jill when she develops a fascination with him, and it's worth noting that her fascination goes beyond a typical infatuation with the handsome, muscular man who saved her life. It's more about what he represents. Prior to the panel I've just put up, we see Jill locking herself in her room and crying as she agonizes over the abuse that is inflicted on her. She wants nothing more than to leave this place, to find some place to escape to. It comes as no surprise then that Jill does what she can to support this mysterious man, providing him with a safe shelter away from the hostile villagers, giving him food, and supplying him with vital information regarding the Misty Valley Elves. This is important to keep in mind as it's the main reason that Jill is so persistent in following Guts, despite all the dangers of it. Guts would not be the same without the courage of this young girl. There are numerous moments in Lost Children that show Jill bringing Guts back to his senses in a way, even when this occurs at a subconscious level for him. Jill serves a similar role to what Casca and the Moonlight Boy would fill in later occasions of the story in regard to the Berserker armor, but right now, Guts has neither of these people around. He has only this random, unwavering little girl 
who puts her life in harm's way time and time again to stand up for what she believes is right. So I want to review all of these scenes one at a time. At the sight of Jill, a bloodthirsty Guts takes a pause in the midst of slaughtering a bunch of children turned demons. As Guts sneaks up on Rosine from behind, Jill is fully shrouded and not in view. It's very likely that Guts is not aware of Jill at this moment. After all, just as a reminder, he wasn't following Jill in this scene, but rather the sensation of the brand. We then get a close-up of Jill's face side by side with Rosine's. Guts proceeds to wildly miss his sword strike despite having the advantage of surprise. Just in case what's going on here isn't clear enough, Puck later comments on Jill's presence, to which Guts makes no reply, clearly in a moment of reflection. After Puck flies off, there's another moment of reflection from Guts, this time it's spelled out clearly for the audience, and we actually see what he's thinking. Even if it wasn't a conscious effort on his part, all signs point to Jill's presence affecting him greatly. Once more, Guts has the advantage of surprise, and the opportunity to land the killing blow on Rosine, but it doesn't pan out, despite Guts being capable of getting the job done. Once again, Guts acknowledges his hesitation, this time even reflecting on Jill's sympathetic story of Rosine's upbringing. Moving on, Guts lands what appears to be a killing blow on Rosine. His blank white eye is a callback to his appearance during the Eclipse, when he was utterly consumed by rage. He appears to have lost control of himself. In reality, he hasn't, not entirely. Guts stops in the midst of his frenzy to cut a cocoon and douse the flames around Jill, thus saving her life and expressing some of his humanity. And just in case there was any doubt, this is later made explicit in a scene where Jill confronts him about this. Finally, we have a memorable scene where Jill does everything she can to stop Guts from landing the final strike on Rosine. Despite the immense risk of it, Jill is ultimately successful, but her father's arrow and the appearance of the Holy Iron Chain Knights makes this a bit more interesting. I've often wondered, had they not interrupted, would Guts have carried on? But regardless, even with the interruption, I believe Guts just as easily could have killed Rosine if he wanted to. But notice how right before he runs away, we get one last close-up on Jill. I believe this is deliberate on Mira's part to emphasize her importance. In the end, to much frustration, Guts takes his leave, with Rosine still alive. Throughout the story, Jill forces Guts to acknowledge his humanity. This sets the stage for Guts' declaration to the Beast of Darkness. Guts is no monster. The Beast makes its very first appearance in Chapter 118, the chapter that immediately follows the Lost Children finale. The timing of this and Skull Knight's words on the topic of Guts' internal struggle are no coincidence. It's a battle that Guts has been fighting since the aftermath of the Eclipse. We saw him at his worst in the Black Swordsman arc. Largely thanks to no small contribution from Jill, Guts was steered toward the positive growth that he so desperately needed. It's an ongoing battle that was even alluded to in the last chapter Mira published while he was still alive, and the theme can be felt in the entirety of Volume 41, further emphasized by Skull Knight's flashback. Jill was key to Guts' path of destruction being avoided. It was also key to him harnessing his anger to his advantage, another theme that is persistent throughout the story. As Guts is the hero of the story and the main opposition to Griffith, his self-mastery will be key to Griffith's downfall. By extension, Jill has been pivotal to that. If you want to take it one step further, without Jill's presence, Guts wouldn't even have made it this far to begin with. So, thinking about overcoming Griffith wouldn't even be an option. Erica is first seen in Chapter 48, in a flashback where she is seen helping Guts with his training in the mountains, after leaving the Band of the Hawk, and again seen patching up his wounds. While this is trivial compared to the next things I will mention, I still wanted to note this to start off. So when Guts reunites with the Band of the Hawk, he talks about his time away, and Judo asks Guts if he has found it, in regard to finding purpose after their conversation some time ago. The same thing that prompted Guts to leave in the first place. Guts responds that in a way he has, as the sword is the only thing that has ever felt natural to him, and so honing his craft gave him satisfaction and purpose. The man who was previously an expert fighter managed to level up even further in strength while finding some genuine sense of peace, and Erica had a small part to play in the matter. 
Erica, who proudly boasts of being a blacksmith's daughter, helped Rickert make Guts' artificial arm with a built-in cannon which got Guts out of many dire situations. He'd be dead many times over without it. There's no point in even listing out the many examples. When Guts returns to Goto's place, Erica rebukes him for lashing out at Rickert upon learning that Costco is lost in the time he was away. The sentiment she expresses about coming back is extremely important too, because as brutal as it sounds, she's bluntly stating that Rickert cut his losses in return to the people he was still able to help. This is the total opposite of what Guts did when he abandoned Casca in his pursuit of revenge. This is an idea that has been emphasized in the past before, such as Rickert expressing this to Guts before he even left initially, and in the Black Swordsman arc when Puck is talking to Vargas. Erica's moment is the perfect precursor to Goto's iconic lecture later in the chapter, which leads to deep introspection from Guts and a total change in motive as he resolves to never lose Casca again. But there's even more to it than this. In chapter 150, Guts finds himself in a similar situation. After Azidro loses Casca, Guts reacts in the same way he did with Rickert. This time, however, Erica isn't around to criticize him, but Guts manages to calm down nonetheless and recognizes his error after learning from that almost identical encounter. Erica contributed to Guts' battle for self-control, not only with her words, but by their association with such a distinct memory. Daiba is an extremely powerful sorcerer who managed to put up a strong fight even against a berserker armor-powered Guts. Erica helped him by using her blacksmith skills to give him a leg bracer for his injured knee. Daiba went on to save Ricker, Erica, Salat, and Salat's Tapasa, providing them all with an escape route from Falconia. Daiba's decision to act was a combination of factors, including his increased ability from Erica's help and the general gestures of kindness that she showed him as well as a willingness to repay the debt. All of these characters will play key roles in the final act of Berserk, and they likely would have died here without Daiba's help, and by extension, Erika's. She even hands Rickert a rocket launcher that buys them crucial time to get away from Rakshas. Luca is an all-around awesome character with a lot going on for her, but I will reserve my fanboying to focus on her larger impact on the world of Berserk as I did with the other characters. In her first appearance, Luca stands up for a vulnerable Casca who gets noticed by Mosgus' Inquisition. After this, she takes Casca in, even going so far as to make up a fake story with the claim that Casca is her sister. This is a big risk to take considering the heretic hunts she just had a close encounter with. Luca associating herself with someone as unpredictable as a Casca with a broken mind is not a gesture to be taken lightly. Furthermore, there is the suspicious brand on Casca's chest, which only adds to the risk and is something that Luca acknowledges. We can't be certain that Casca would have died here without Luca's intervention, but the chances certainly would have been higher. Needless to say, the death of Casca would drastically affect the world of Berserk for the worse. Beyond this, Luca's existence and actions are important to the Berserk world in a way that may be surprising, and that lies in the continued existence of the Demon Child and his eventual transformation into the Moonlight Boy. Let me first establish the most direct proof of this before moving into more speculative territory. After expending his energy to save Casca from Mosgus, the Demon Child is on the verge of death. That is, until the Egg of the Perfect World takes pity upon him and swallows the child so he won't die alone. Unknowingly, the Egg has just saved the child's life and granted him a new form of existence, in the form of the Moonlight Boy, once Griffith is reincarnated. When the Egg is explaining his story to Luca, he says that Luca's actions in bringing Casca to the Holy Ground are part of a greater will. However, the Moonlight Boy is almost certainly a complication that Griffith and the God Hand did not anticipate. And how did the Moonlight Boy come about? Because the Demon Child was following Casca to keep her safe, which is what ultimately led him to the Egg, where he was granted his unique existence. This is exemplary of how the slightest actions can have profound impacts on the world of Berserk. In a world in which so much happens for a reason because of the will of a higher power, anything that wasn't planned for is a big deal. 
The importance of this in the greater context of the Berserk world is, of course, that the Moonlight Boy will be key to Griffith's defeat, something that has been long since speculated about and is almost certain to be true. His existence is the only sort of weakness that Griffith has that we have seen yet. This is more important now than ever since we recently saw how useless Guts was against Griffith, even though nearly 200 chapters have passed since the Hill of Swords encounter. I'm sure you know the drill by now. No Moonlight Boy equals a different Berserk world, and a much worse one at that. Of course, this doesn't even factor in the many times he saved Guts' life. Right, no Guts would be a problem too. And now it's time for me to get a bit more speculative, although I still believe there's a case to be made here. I have a faint suspicion that Luca is not only responsible for the egg coming into contact with the demon child, but was also an influence for the egg's ultimate act of compassion. Throughout the arc, we see the egg moving around, spying on everyone in the area, and after detailing his harsh backstory, the egg mentions one of the people he spied on, Luca herself. When Luca asked why the egg brought her down here, he answered that it was because he wanted someone to hear his story, and it didn't matter who it was. This may be true, but I still believe it to be likely that Luca being that person is not a coincidence. You see, while other humans shunned the egg and threw rocks at him before he even made his sacrifice and became an apostle, back when he was still a regular human, Luca took pity on him even after hearing his ominous words, seeing his monstrous new form, and being kidnapped by him. She managed to show compassion even after all of that. How many other people in the world, let alone on the holy grounds which is rife with suffering, would have been capable of doing what she did? Luca specializes in caring for the downtrodden. She tries to keep everyone around her on equal footing. She cares for Casca, who is the textbook definition of helpless in her traumatized state, and in Falconia, Luca is an innkeeper whose job is to look after refugees and get them lodging. She even states that families with elderly members get priority for rooms on the first floor, and asks that those with sickness or injury reach out so she can get them a doctor. Luca is very much portrayed as a mother figure throughout the series, as a person who looks out for those beneath her, as someone who helps them stand up rather than step on them. The Egg could have used someone like her. Just consider his word choice in his final moments, literally right before he spots the demon child. The language is that of someone beneath, who has been scorned by the world itself. This is quite literally what has happened as he was buried by the earth and abused by the people above. Returning to Luca, we get two lines of dialogue where she refers to this kind of behavior, of looking down upon those beneath you. It's literal too, considering in this scene, she's talking to a man high up on his horse. This all goes back to the speculative point that I've just outlined. If Luca was the one person that the egg spied on who showed him the kindness that humanity is capable of, it's not far-fetched to believe that her existence inspired him to swallow the demon child. The mind is a complex thing, after all, which works in ways we aren't even aware of. The whole situation with Jill and Guts that I described previously is just one example in this very manga of how we unknowingly act under the guidance of our subconscious. How fitting is that in a world dictated by causality? Cynthia Enloe's argument about the unseen women who shape the world makes a lot of sense, and when one applies that lens to Berserk, things get interesting. You see, the accumulated impact of individual people is even more noteworthy in a series such as Berserk, which is a bleak fantasy setting where reality itself has been manipulated by evil forces on a massive timescale that we don't even know the extent of. The concept of causality, even in our own world, is simply that of cause and effect. Every action results in something else. The same is true of Berserk, but the idea of evil and the God Hand manipulate this principle to their advantage. They made things such as Griffith's rise and fall possible for his eclipse ceremony by manipulating history. However, things don't always go as planned. Guts surviving the eclipse thanks to Skull Knight's interference is the clearest example of this, since the God Hand themselves acknowledge the fact. Of course, the key here is Skull Knight, who is a wild card. He is an entity that cannot be so easily manipulated, which is appropriate considering he's no longer human. Even so, the God Hand is well aware of his existence and his tendency to strike at temporal junction points, those pivotal moments in time when causality may be nudged off track. This awareness even appears to have been factored into the Grand Plan, as exhibited by Griffith's words in the legendary Volume 34. Skull Knight doesn't have a perfect track record thus far, but the point is he is at least capable of disrupting things. 
It is then worth mentioning that these three women I've discussed have all been associated with a common through line, elves, which are creatures that are not subjected to causality's currents in the traditional sense, since the idea of evil manipulates the world through humans, the same humans who gave birth to the idea of evil through their subconscious. Now, of course, I'm referencing a chapter that is not canon, but nothing in future chapters ever contradicted it, and the idea of evil is even referenced later in the manga, so I don't feel a need to discount it yet. Especially with Mira's death, there's no guarantee that we'll ever see it again, but as of now, it makes sense to base these ideas off of this chapter. Now, let me clarify something that a lot of people might not be aware of. Elf or sprite, or however you choose to translate it, is a generic term in Berserk for a variety of astral creatures. It doesn't just refer to what many of us think of from other forms of media as fairies, which are Puck and Evilera, but of course in Berserk they're known as pixies. Anyways, elves in Berserk also include entities like Isma and the other Marrows, as well as dwarves like Hanar, the person who forged both Skull Knight's coffin armor and the Berserker armor. When Puck says in chapter 142 that Skull Knight kind of felt like an elf, he is almost certainly referring to the fact that Skull Knight's armor, to which his spirit is bound, was crafted by a dwarf, a type of elf. Skull Knight himself is thus associated with elves, and is always seen trying to fight against causality in his plight against the God Hand. Luca is saved by him, rides with him on his horse, and exchanges quite a few words with him, so the contact is clear. Jill and Erica frequently came into very direct contact with Puck, an elf. Erica specifically became very close with Rickert, who was saved by Skull Knight, which led to his survival in the form of his absence at the Eclipse. Additionally, during the time when he tried to return to Midland, Rickert traveled with a troop where he encountered Puck, and secured some elf dust that would later be used to save Guts and Casca's life. Rickard's contributions don't end there, and they won't end until the story is finished. For the sake of staying on topic, just consider his decision to create the Hill of Swords, crafted from the blades he learned to forge with the help of Godo and Erika, which forced Guts to consider how he has confronted his Eclipse trauma up until now. They thus further watered the seeds that were sown by Jill just prior in the Lost Children section. This advanced Guts in the right direction in his fight against himself, a fight that must be overcome if the evil forces that currently plague the Berserk world are ever to be overcome. And by Rickert's side this whole time and providing him with a purpose to keep going was none other than Erica. Ironically enough, the meeting between the two was only made possible thanks to elves, who once inhabited the area Erica calls home, as pointed out by Skull Knight after the Eclipse. You can run with these through lines forever. For example, Guts Black Swordsman Rampage was possible only because Erica acted as Casca's caretaker, since she was the only person Casca trusted after the Eclipse. This allowed Guts to, rather unhealthily, devote all his mental faculties to hunting apostles, which undeniably provided him with the necessary skills and experience that molded him into the expert demon hunter we know and love today. So you can see how all of these things add up to make a profound difference. This is cause and effect. This is causality. Sometimes it has good results. Mira even has Puck slyly comment on this in the same scene where Puck mentions his first encounter with Rickert before the eclipse. So you remove Erica from the equation, and the story would look different in a way we cannot even begin to fathom. It makes me think of when a movie character time travels to the past, and they're always told not to mess with anything, because something as simple as picking up a pack of gum from the store will result in a dystopian future or something crazy like that. Exploring causality makes me think of that in a way. The main takeaway is, everything that has happened in the past has led these characters in this world to where it is now and this will only become more apparent as we learn more about what Mira's plans were through the ongoing continuation project. To return to the main point, aside from Elves and Skull Knight, our three unnoticed women all came into contact with Guts, the struggler who wasn't supposed to survive the Eclipse, the branded swordsman who is a half-step outside of the reason of the world, a fish who can perhaps breach the water's surface. Since his birth, Guts is a person who has been presented as a bringer of chaos. He ruins the established order of things. His birth, which is seen as a bad omen, results in a bitter Gambino facing his death and sending his mercenary group into chaos. Guts, joining the band of the Hawk, disrupts the status quo, deeply upsetting Casca and driving her conflict in the Golden Age. To list all of the times post-Eclipse that Guts pulled up to any random location and chaos followed would be futile. I mean, that's just what he does. 
but you can look at the Black Swordsman arc and the trauma that would forever be inflicted upon Theresa for an easy example. Where Guts goes, destruction follows, and I don't think this recurring theme has seen its conclusion yet. Far from it, in fact, as Guts still has to crash the biggest party of all, that which is the God Hand's grand plan. In this regard, the three women I've analyzed have all had encounters and actions of their own that have had subtle but important effects on the flow of causality. Humans and Berserk are still capable of acting of their own volition, and the presence of elves contributes to making this all the more important. As a result, deviations from the plan become more likely. If Berserk is to have an even remotely positive ending through which the world deviates from the grand orchestrated plans of evil, it will have only been possible thanks to the combined influence of numerous minute circumstances throughout the ages. And that includes the actions of even these three women, who fans may recognize as important, but will almost certainly be lost and forgotten, never to make it into the annals of Berserk's in-world history.